Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I'm just going to mute myself. Yep. Uh, my name is Paul Pizarre. I'm a member of Datadog. I'm a member of the, the DRE team that we have. Hey, Corey. Uh, we, uh, so DRE stands for Data Reliability Engineer. And before I start, I just want to say like, uh, I'm, I'm alone here presenting and I'm super happy to do it, but this is really a, a several team endeavor that I'm going to present. I want to give a shout out to also Jamie Alkisa, uh, who is standing in the shadows there. Uh, if you have any questions about Kafka Kit specifically, he's your man. Uh, I'm, he, he's the mastermind of that. He's just, he doesn't want me to say it. Uh, all right. So before I start, why am I even talking to you? Um, so I mentioned it, we are a member uh, of the data reliability engineering. So what do we do here at Datadog? We make sure that the data stores that we have are safe, they're available, and they're reliable. We make sure that, um, you know, we can help the different teams that we have with their uh, data modeling issues. We scale the clusters when they need to be scaled, and uh, believe me, they need to be scaled. And we try to make it, you know, cost efficient, and we uh, write tooling when they need to be uh, written. And we are in charge of uh, PostgreSQL, Kafka, Zookeeper, Cassandra, and it says Elasticsearch, but we handle a part of the Elasticsearch cluster that we have here at Datadog. Um, we are a team of uh, four amazing SREs, um, me not included in that. So Seth is here. And Corey uh, might be lurking over there. Is just at the at the at the very end of the of the the area. You can reach out to me personally, Behubal or Jamie Alkisa, if you have any questions about Kafka Kit. Uh, so the tooling that we're going to present, or if you have any questions at all. And obviously, um, given that this is our house, uh, we are hiring. <laughs> obviously. So. A bit of, uh, you know, some words about the Kafka infrastructure that we have. I really like the fact that Andreas has presented the, like, the inner workings of Kafka. Uh, and we also, we have a completely different take on how we run things. And I find it interesting to have different point of views. Um, so we have, you know, multiple regions, uh, mul uh, multiple cloud providers. We have, you know, up to 40 plus Kafka and Zookeeper clusters. Each Kafka has its own Zookeeper. We don't share the Zookeepers. Um, we have petabytes of data on local storage. We don't actually use EBS, uh, hence the, I find it interesting to compare the different ways of doing things. Uh, we have up to trillions of messages per day and, and actually more. We have double, uh, you know, digit gigabytes per second bandwidth and we actually handle that just Jimmy and I. Uh, it's not, a, it's not, not to brag or anything, it's just really not the point, but what I'm trying to get at is that to be able to do that uh, because we didn't have anyone else, we, uh, hence that we are hiring, uh, I'm gonna emphasize on that. Um, we had to build a lot of tooling. Um, so, hence Kafka Kit. Um, so, what is Kafka Kit exactly? It's, it's a collection of different tools that we use to manage or to, to, to manage our uh, Kafka clusters. Um, and so, the first command that we have in there is called Topic Mapper. And so, it we, we're not really creative names, so it maps topics. Um, and so it does partition to broker mapping. So if, if you ever administrator a uh, Kafka cluster, one of the things that you have to do sometimes if you lose a broker or if you have to scale up or scale down a cluster, which has like happened once, I think for us, uh, we, we, you have to like feed Kafka a chase on file saying, all right, that topic, that partition is gonna go there and there. Uh, and that chase on file generation is actually the crux of the problem um, because Kafka has a generation uh, tooling that will help you, but it will not help you in certain kind of situations. Um, so let's say, for example, you want to scale uh, out your cluster, but you want to do it in a smart fashion because you, you find out that you have some uh, unbalanced partitions. You might have some partitions that are bigger than the others. And so actually Topic Map will help you with that because it has a, uh, an option that we call uh, storage, re uh, storage no. placement storage. Uh, that will actually use metrics. So in our case, it fetches them from Datadog, but you can actually um, use this. We don't lock in Topic Mapper with Datadog. You can actually PR, uh, you know, the, the, the command line to use any metrics provider that you like. Uh, it, could, you know, it could be your pr local Prometheus or anything else. Uh, and it will actually look at the, the, the partition size and bin pack the partitions on your cluster uh, to avoid having hot topics, uh, sorry, hot brokers and cold brokers. So this is an example of that. So at the, at before and after, uh, we basically perform a storage-based uh, rebalancing. So we had a very cold, uh, like unused brokers and a very hot broker up to 85-ish percent. And so after the fact, on totally new brokers, we actually rebalance the cluster in a very kind of efficient way. Um, and you can see the scale up, up uh, you know, at the beginning, but you can see that the spread has really 
uh, shrunk after the operation. And it has, a, it has a nice side effect that if you have some very hard brokers, uh, you might need to provision more brokers to accommodate for that. But in, in that case, we actually were able to reduce the broker count by a couple of brokers, meaning that we, at, the end of the, at the end of the month, we pay a little bit less. Um, so when we rolled this out, we actually cut down in the hundreds of brokers. Uh, so that was an interesting feature to have. There's another command in there that's called auto throttle. And it's the first time in my life I've been able to say it correctly, uh, given that I'm French. Uh, but what it, it will do is actually fairly interesting. So if, if you ever did a rebalancing in earlier version of Kafka, it was a kind of crazy train operation where you turn it on and then it was happening. And there was no pausing it, there was no stopping it. Uh, but then early, like later versions of Kafka introduced what we call what they call a throttle, and so you could you could uh, allocate a, a given amount of bandwidth to that replication so that it does not step on the consumer traffic stores because this is what you want to protect. This is your real time data stream that you really do not do not want to impact. Uh, so when you start the reassignment, there is an option now. You say dash dash throttle, and you give the bandwidth that you want to allow to it in bytes. The thing is that throttle can evolve because your cluster conditions can evolve. You can have one few consumer, you can, add, you can add a consumer to the cluster during that rebalancing, meaning that your initial conditions will not exactly always be valid. Um, so we, we wrote a, a bit of uh, a tooling that we call Topic Mapper and Topic Mapper will actually look at the cluster conditions in real time. Again, it's not locked in with Datadog, but we have a Datadog backend for it. It's the only backend that we have, obviously, but it's, it's really open to PRs. Um, and so what it will do is that if you look at the event stream and you start from the bottom, it will, it will see that there is an ongoing replication on topic redacted on four different brokers. And it will uh, set the throttle to like 174 megabytes. And then it will actually set it higher. And at some point the topic, the reassignment will be done. And then it will kind of garbage collect the throttle that will put uh, during the reassignments. And so what that does for us is that we can actually launch a reassignment operation that used to take, like still take hours, but we can actually be confident that it's going to go well. Whereas in the past, we would be stuck on the computers kind of hoping that everything would be okay. And if not, we get paged and we'd have to react to that. So we actually got us a lot of you know, time to work on other things. Uh, so that was nice. And so, like I mentioned, these are not tied to the Datadog metrics backend. It's actually, we haven't implemented anything else because we don't need that, but it's really open to pull requests and you don't have to be a Datadog customer to use Kafka Kit. Uh, it's something I really wanted to emphasize. Another kind of practice that we build up with, uh, you know, Jerry over the time is that we are using what we call maps. And so topic mapping is just an assignment of, so you can do that actually with topic mapper in the end, but this is like pseudocode that you could have in your uh, config management uh, tooling. And you, so the map one is we basically map, we assign every topic that starts with test topic to the brokers hundred, uh, sorry, thousand and one, two, three, four, five, six. And for the load testing and latency testing, we assign them to other brokers. And so that will actually, in the end, be fed to Topic Mapper that will generate the partition assignments and just then we'll be able to apply it. And so what that gives us is we can actually have different specification and different numbers of brokers for each of these maps. Uh, so let's say that the test topic are actually fairly small. And so we, we use i 34 x large, but then the load testing, we're going to have that for a while and then it's just going to go away. So we'll, uh, for some reason, we decide to take like fairly large machines. We can have like sub clusters in, a, in, 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 uh, in the environments of a Kafka cluster. We can have like sub pools. Um, and this, also, this is very interesting because sometimes we get a, a topic with a lot of traffic and we have to shard it out uh, and to isolate it on you know, dedicated brokers. And this is how we do it. And given the topic size and the topic throughput, then we kind of, you know, we, we, we perform capacity planning and then we choose the instance size that actually would fit the topic. All right, so this is Kafka Kit. This is what got us uh, through the day and through the nights. Um, but then um, Datadog decided that there wasn't enough and we had to work on something else at the same time. So they said, all right, you have to move to Kubernetes. Um, so a bit of background about why we decided to do that. Um, we recently announced that we opened um, a new instance of Datadog in, in the EU that has nothing to do with Datadog in the US. We don't share any data. It's, it's completely isolated. It you know, has to do with uh, data sovereignty, and 
it was an opportunity for Datadog as, as a company to like leave, leave legacy behind and start fresh. Uh, there's a talk by Rob Ball, who is actually maybe, yeah, he's like up there, who is our compute genius, uh, compute in the sense of Kubernetes, he's your guy. Uh, and so uh, with Laurent Bernay, who might also be around, yep, he's the one in the shadows. Um, they they uh, both gave a talk about, it's, it's called Kubernetes, the very, very hard way of Datadog, and they explain how we set up the clusters. Um, and so the idea was that everyone was going to use it. There, would, there will no be, uh, sorry, there wouldn't be any snowflake deployments or config management for any stateful applications. So here we were uh, actually looking at, you know, if you have any problem, you might have the idea of going to Hack and Use. And so we, I went to Hack and Use personally, and I read, all right, Hack and Use, Kubernetes Kafka. And what I read was, I was either a bad human being or a very, very bad engineer. <laughs> all right. Um, but we did it. Uh, the Datadog EU is actually running in production right now, and the Kafka that is backing, well, the, the Kafka clusters, they're backing that Datadog instance are running in Kubernetes. So I'm here to explain kind of the reasoning behind that and the hypothesis and the choices that we made. Uh, but before I start, I want to know, like, does anyone here has no clue what Kubernetes is? All right, one person. All right, I'm going to go super quickly. I like in one sentence. It's an environment in which we can orchestrate uh, deployments of containers. All right. For, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, it, it was tough. Um, so what we decided to do is, so we had to dockerize Kafka and we had to um, kind of decide how we would uh, deploy it to Kubernetes. The first kind of choice that we made was there will not be any noisy neighbor. We, we want to be isolated on dedicated machines. Um, that's not the case for every single application, but for Kafka, given the traffic that we have, uh, we want to be able to say, all right, this is our territory, you keep away. Um, and so we actually have the compute team that, that worked on a project that is called the node group controller that allows us to define a custom definition. So Mark is here, Mark is a node group guy. He's like talking to, something else, to someone else, trying to say, I, I didn't do that. Uh, but he's the one who did it. And it's, it's pretty amazing because I can declare in a YAML file uh, what I want in terms of, of uh, instances. And it will actually talk to, in the end, to um, AWS and provision an ASG for me. So I can say, all right, I want that many machine, that specification. I, I, I code that into YAML and Kubernetes does the rest. Um, so we do that. We avoid noisy neighbors by using, by leveraging the node pool, uh, sorry, the node group controller. That is an internal project, uh, but you could, you could go around doing the same thing via like, doing something else. Um, in terms of data persistence, uh, we, I mentioned that we're using instance stored drives, so we don't have the opportunity to just reattach volumes on new instance. If I bring up a new instance, I have to replicate the data, and that's going to be like, that, that's going to go on the network. Um, so the data obviously is persisted between pod restarts. We're using volumes for that. And if you spin up a new instance, because maybe your old instance died, you have to stream the data back to the new one. Um, something that wasn't exactly super intuitive at the beginning is that how do we make instance rack aware? Um, there might be better answers in the future, but what we did at the beginning was that we spin up what is called an init container, which is a container that runs before the actual application container. And that init container contains the kube control command line, which is the command line to Kubernetes. It will look at its environment, figure out in which node it's running, then we'll talk to Kubernetes and, and ask for the availability zone that that node is running on. And that information would be stored in a config file uh, that will, be, it will be inserted into the Kafka config file. Um, so we, it's kind of hacky, but it got us so far. All right, in terms of Kubernetes primitives, um, we use, like I said, node groups, which are uh, in-house custom resource definition to declare uh, the compute that we need. Uh, we use persistent volumes and persistent volume claims. So very quickly, what, that, what they do is that a persistent volume represents in, is an object in Kubernetes saying, uh, I'm a node and I have local storage, or I have attached storage, and you can use that. And a PVC, a volume claim, is a, is a claim from an application on that volume. And why we do that? We do that because even though we might want to have uh, applications running on the same machines, let's say we do, we have a rogue app, that app will not be able to claim that volume and write to it because it already has a claim. So we kind of protect ourselves again against data shadowing and data uh, erasing or corruption because 
another application would not be able to claim that volume. Um, with a headless service for Kafka. So in Kubernetes, you have a service, you resolve the service DNS, and it will actually take you to the actual application pods. And a headless service means that if, if, when you want to talk to the service, it will actually give you all of the pod IPs. Uh, so when you first start to, uh, you're, you're a producer or a consumer, you want to start talking to Kafka, you connect to the bootstrap servers, that is actually the service, uh, service name, that will get resolved into a list of broker IPs, you take your pick, and then that broker is going to give you the, the, the cluster metadata, and there you go. For Zookeeper, we had a bunch of issues in the past. I think, uh, Andres, you, you mentioned it, uh, where if you Zookeeper changes IP, your, your consumers or producers might want to talk to Zookeeper directly, and if they change IP, it's going to, you know, you could have some issues. So we use what, what is called a cluster IP service. So it's a virtual IP that is fixed, and that is uh, routed to the actual pod IPs via Kubernetes. You don't have to care about it. So as a client, Zookeeper always has the same IP. And if you rotate all of your nodes, uh, the, your producers or consumers wouldn't even know about it. So that's pretty handy. We use host network. Uh, so it's, it's a really weird thing to do in Kubernetes uh, because it means that no other node on that, sorry, no other pod on that node will, will be able to run. Um, you know, we, we wouldn't be able to have two Kafkas on the same machine, but this is valid given our, uh, the first hypothesis. So we, we do that uh, because we want to be able to guarantee that no pod is going to change IP during its lifetime. Um, we use deployments to ensure that our helper pod is going to be around. I'm going to talk about that in a second. Config maps to deploy the Kafka configuration. Uh, cron job to apply topic uh, configuration. I'm going to go back to it in, in a sec. And stateful sets. And I think stateful sets are the most important part of the whole setup. A stateful set is a primitive in, in Kubernetes that helps you manage stateful applications. Um, so how do we do that exactly? We dedicate one node group and stateful set per map. So remember, I, have, I had map A and map B, uh, or one and two, and they each had a number of brokers with a, a, like an instance type specification. So each of these map is actually translated into a node group, so an ASG in the end, and a stateful set. And the reason we do that is that we don't share any topics nor partitions between these two stateful sets, so we can actually roll them out in completely in parallel, and there will not be any offline partition at any time. Uh, and also, we can scale them independently. Let's say we want to scale them to map one. We can do that without having any impact on the second one. Um, so this is kind of why a Kafka cluster looks like. Um, at the bottom, we have Zookeeper, so it's a node group on which we run a stateful set, the Zookeeper stateful set, and it's resolved by a cluster IP service. And then you have three different stateful sets, map A, map B, map C, uh, and they, are, they might have different sizes. So like, it could be a bigger instance size for map A because the squares are bigger. Um, and then the whole cluster is, is being resolved by the single Kafka headless service. And then we have a toolbox on which we have a couple of tools. And we have the auto throttle um, service that runs independently. It will detect if we have a rolling restart, uh, sorry, a, a reassignment, and will actually set the throttle, like I mentioned before. Um, so, all right, you have Kafka and Kubernetes, but the, it's not exactly enough to deploy it. So you need to be able to operate safely and to rotate the nodes if you have to like update the configuration, for example. So, if you want to be able to do a rolling restart, what you have to figure out first is when is my pod healthy? And there's two different notions of health in Kubernetes. There is the liveness and there is the readiness. So the liveness is, is, is the process just running? And the readiness means, is this ready to accept traffic? So for Zookeeper, it's running when the, the port 2181 is open, but it's actually ready when it's either a leader or a follower. If it's in a state like that Zookeeper does not accept requests, you don't want to have traffic set to that instance. And for Kafka, if the port is open, it's live. But then if the, the, the assumption that we made here, and we wrote a, a custom probe to do that, is if every single partition on that broker is in sync, it means that the broker is ready. And that gives us something that is very, very interesting, is that we can have safe rolling restarts. Because we can have, like every, so this is the number of under-replicated partitions per topic in the cluster. And so every time we go back to zero under replicated partitions, meaning that the, the pod that we just restarted is completely back to full sync, we can just, we can just move on to the second one, or to, sorry, the next one. And so by, by getting that 
simple primitive write, we actually get a very, very like, interesting property in that cluster. We get, we get safety. Um, the rolling and restart are kind of slow, maybe, but then they're very safe. Um, now, talking about broker identity, um, when we first experimented with it, we, we had a case that was kind of interesting. We had broker one, two, three uh, with assigned data, and then we rolling restarted the cluster and we had automatic ID assignments. And we ended up with brokers uh, four, five, six, and they didn't have any data assigned and we lost the cluster. So that, that was like in a test bench, nothing production ready, but we figured that we wanted to be able to assign stable IDs basically. Um, so the way it works is that you assign an ID to a pod that is when it's first scheduled on a node. You label the pod and the node in Kubernetes. If you shut down the pod and reschedule it on the same node, the bootstrap script will actually look up the node labels before. And if it finds one, it will actually use that ID and just proceed. If it doesn't find any, meaning maybe you have like rescheduled that pod on a new node because maybe you've lost the instance, uh, it would actually fetch, I'm sorry, generate a new broker ID and you'll have to run a reassignment. So this is kind of what we do. We don't move EBS volumes around because we don't have any EBS volumes. We want to keep broker IDs as stable as possible. And then if your machine dies, you have to replicate data, meaning that you actually have another broker. This is kind of what we think, how we think about the identity. We do the same thing for Zookeeper. The thing is for Kafka, we actually use Zookeeper for the broker ID generation. For Zookeeper, we don't have Zookeeper, so we use Kubernetes itself. Uh, we annotate a, gener a, a dynamically generated config map. Uh, it's kind of a weird thing to do, but I'd be happy to talk about it, like if you have any questions about it, but it's, um, it's a kind of hairy problem, you know, chicken and egg, so we, 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 it's kind of a hack, but it's an interesting hack. Um, we specify every single topic sta statically in configuration. So we specify the topic name, obviously, the retention, the number of partitions, the, uh, the um, replication factor, any topic level config. Um, everything is defined into config maps. And then we have a cron job that just applies it. So why do we keep reapplying the same thing is we might have someone that will apply like a, 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 a temporary retention. We want to trim a topic is, is, is getting too hot and we have to do something, but then we don't want to keep that temporary configuration. We want to always go back to the, co the source control configuration to avoid getting any drift. Um, so we use a cron job primitive to do that. And so in the toolbox I mentioned, we have a couple of tools. So we have a topic mapper tool I mentioned. Uh, we have a couple of scripts that will allow us to like, look at the topics, look at the topics configuration, uh, interact with them. Um, we have a lot of tools, either the native Kafka tools or just you know, Python scripts or Go script that we wrote that allow us to manage the, the, the consumer offsets. Uh, we have a tool uh, written by Jamie called Sangonel that is a Kafka load testing. Um, we have config management, like set top, you know, that config on that topic. Um, the auto throttle tool uh, that I mentioned. Uh, and we have a couple of scripts that, I'll, well, just the one actually, that handle the Zookeeper dynamic configuration management. And I'll, I'll go to that in just one second. Um, and the, the nice thing is that every single um, script that we have in there or tool that we have in there that has a, um, a side effect on the cluster, like set topic retention, uh, set topic config, something like that, we'll actually send an event to Datadog so we can have an audit trail in our dashboards. Um, sorry, I talked about how do we deploy Zuki, sorry, how do we deploy Kafka and Kubernetes? Um, but the thing is, we also have to manage Zookeeper and Zookeeper is as well deployed in Kubernetes in the same way. We have a dedicated node pool, we have a stateful set. Um, and we at first experimented with something that we were running before. And it's, it's something that is, a, it's a Netflix project that is called Exhibitor. And to understand why we need something uh, as Exhibitor, uh, that is just not, you know, we need something else in Zookeeper. Um, you, you need to understand the kind of issue that you, you have when you have like a, a cloud environment in Zookeeper. You might have your Zookeeper instances to just move around. And Zookeeper doesn't like that very much because each server needs to know exactly what IP is, you know, in the ensemble. Um, 
And so what we used to do is we used to run that program, run, you know, called Exhibitor that will actually rolling restart every single instance every time there was a change in the Zookeeper ensemble until everyone agreed on the same configuration. And that rolling restart really had high impact, uh, sometime cluster, uh, sorry, customer facing uh, consequences. And so we realized that the latest version of Zookeeper actually doesn't need that anymore because it has a dynamic ensemble reconfiguration built in as a Zookeeper primitive. So you could actually like connect the Zookeeper saying, all right, you know what? You had one, two, three, but three is gone and four is now up. Um, out with the three, in with the four, and you can do that within a single Zookeeper transaction. Uh, that's super interesting because it brings reliability to the cluster. It brings stability. And if you combine that with the fact that we have a cluster IP, meaning it's a stable IP, um, we don't even think about Zookeeper anymore. Uh, and the last topic I'm gonna, I'm gonna broach is the monitoring part of it. Um, all right, we have Zookeeper, we have Kafka and Kubernetes, it's, it's going mostly fine, uh, but then we wanna know when it's not. And the, every, everything that you read on Kafka is you wanna get page when you have under-replicated partitions, but what if you have thousands of partitions? Uh, do you wanna get page for each one? And the answer is no, because your phone is gonna melt, uh, your spouse is gonna not like that. Uh, we've been there, it's not great. And all right, we wanna do better. Um, so what we do, we have a custom Datadog probe that will actually look at not partition, but topics. If you have any under-replicated partition, it will actually page you at the topic level. Um, and if you have more than under, so sorry, more than five under-replicated topics, it will actually just send you the one page saying, all right, something is really weird with that cluster, you should probably check it out. Um, it also exports tag partition metrics. So if you, if you look at the offline partition count, for example, in, in the JMX Kafka metrics, they're not tagged with the actual topic. So you don't exactly know, looking at the metric, what topic is impacted. So we do that as well. And um, we recently rolled out a small script that will listen on the Kafka, sorry, on the Kubernetes events and mute that page if we're just running uh, a stateful set rolling restart. Because we don't want to have self-inflicted pages. Um, so this is an example of the kind of the page that we're uh, getting. We're able to running a Python script, a Python Datadog uh, agent check. We can actually generate that text and send it. And this is what we get in um, PagerDuty basically. And the last thing that we monitor are basically resources, configuration, and membership. We look at over or underutilized uh, disks at the map level. We look for um, forecasts about data usage. So we want to get, we want to have a low priority page if Datadog thinks that we are probably going to be facing a scaling issue in the next two or three days, for example. Uh, we want to be able to plan it. We look at unused brokers because this is not, this is money that we just spend on nothing if we don't have nothing, if we don't have anything on these, uh, on these brokers. And if we have sustained elevated traffic on the brokers, it means that we have we don't have a lot of uh, available bandwidth for the, an, an, a possible replication that would happen, a reassignment. Uh, so we wanna monitor that and we wanna be able to scale out the cluster if we're in the red zone for too long. And for, as, for the topics, we look for a replication factor of one. It means that if you roll out a, a stateful set, uh, at some point you will have offline partitions because you don't have any uh, additional replicas for these partitions. If you have, an incoherent Zookeeper in similar configuration. So if we go back to the example, we have broker one, two, uh, sorry, server Zookeeper one, two, three, we lose three, we get four. Four knows about one and two, but one and two do not know about four. They still believe that three is, is just around. So we have to reconfigure everything to kind of harmonize the configuration. And this is a very, very high priority page because if, if you lose Zookeeper, you kind of lose everything. Uh, and then we also wanna know if we have an unsafe Zookeeper ensemble number. Uh, meaning that if we have four members instead of, uh, of, of five, we, we, we get paged. Uh, if we have three instead of five, we get paged a lot. And if we have two, we just, everything kind of breaks down. Um, and so what's next? Um, right, so everything is kind of manual at the moment. We have a lot of stuff in our toolbox. We wanna make it possible to interact with the cluster through an API. And when we have that, we can have a lot of things actually done for us using an operator meaning that a lot of the stuff that we'll be doing with Jamie is basically drinking margarita and pretend to be doing stuff. Uh, <laughs> and we also want to work on the retention control um, project. It means that instead of paging someone because 
the, the the disk usage is getting high, we want to be able to trim the data just a little bit within safe margins instead of having a human intervention up to a point where it's not possible and then you have to do something. But if you're facing like seasonal data usage pattern, it might be good to have a machine do that for you instead of just paging a human being on a Sunday, for example. Um, and that's pretty much all I have. Oh, no, I don't, because I added that at the last time. I, I love that Steve Jobs kind of, oh, and more and more thing. Um, we released, well, Jamie released a, a Kafka a Kafka Kit blog post. Um, if you look for um, Kafka Kit data doc blog, you'll find it. There's a lot of information I haven't covered. There's a lot of details and implementation strategies and all this stuff. There's like a, a really a, a big walkthrough topic mapper, uh, which is completely open source. And like I mentioned, it's not tied to Datadog, so you can, you can have a look at that and use it even though you're not a customer. Uh, and that's this time really all I have. Um, so thank you so much for being here and uh, I'll take any questions. Yep. Oh, um, all right, should I just throw it around? Sorry if I, if I... Um, where I should... So here, oh yeah. So the, the the main question you didn't mention, like uh, languages and the version of clients, because you mentioned a couple of times that you need a connection oh, yeah. from clients to the keeper, which is totally unnecessary with recent version. Um, yeah, of it is. Clients. It is. That's that's completely right. Um, so a data that we run mostly Go, a little bit of Python. Can and, you mention like specific client because there's like three oh, or yeah. four different we, clients? We, use, we are we are heavy users of Sarama, but when uh, we can, we actually now use Liberty Kafka. So it comes from Kafka Go, um, and the clients that have uh, connections to Zookeeper actually still manage their offset with Zookeeper, or sometimes they, they even have to store data in Zookeeper for their usage themselves. Like Sarama uh, basically does it because it's. Sarama would do it, but let's maybe it's an application that consumes data from, from Kafka, but also stores data in Zookeeper as a key value store, for example. And um, in the past, where we didn't have that fixed IP for Zookeeper, uh, th these applications would actually be in distress because they would lose their connection at some point. Um, you mentioned Zookeeper 3.5, which is not kind of like a part of officially supported uh, branch. It's uh, still 3.5 yes. and 3.7. That's kind of unstable Zookeeper branch. 3. Yeah, 4, 2. It's, 6. it's still in beta mode. But it has yeah, so you have a, your own kind of like a build, uh, I mean, like images uh, that use this version, right? Um, we, we are taking Zookeeper 3.5.4 beta off the shelf. Like we haven't any customization, any in-house patch to Zookeeper. Um, we accept the fact that it's a, a beta product because Zookeeper is extremely stable, has been in alpha beta for four years. We, we like, we, it gives us more than for, for the moment that it has cost us. Uh, if, if there was a Zookeeper in, uh, induced outage, we would actually be really interested in knowing why. But for the moment, it's actually giving a loss, uh, us a lot of stability that we didn't have before. And you mentioned, like, last, last question. Um, you mentioned that you have some custom load testing suite. Uh, what is missing in uh, standard Kafka, um, Kafka producer perf test and Kafka consumer perf test uh, type of suite? I'm going to defer to Jamie on this one. I need a, do I need to draw this? No, no, it's, it's fine. <laughs> All right. Does this work? Hey, yeah, so this was actually created like a couple years ago. Um, so I think the first time that I used the out of the box one, there was, um, it was the fact that it was just like a Java client, right? Or is, it was kind of doing something simple. So and this is like something bad. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's not, it's not bad. It's that particularly if you actually look at load testing, um, your client is actually part of the load testing system, right? Like part of the performance, um, you know, the entire, like you have to look at the entire system, like not just the cluster that you're load testing. Um, the actual clients that you're using are actually important. So I wrote the load tester because it was wrapped around the actual Go client that I was using at the time. And part of it was also like the concurrency and um, like it, it was really about patterning, um, kind of like what I actually saw in the producers that I was using at the time. Um, those configurations just didn't really exist in the out of the box one. Um, and then one other thing too is that the way I wanted to look at the data um, histograms of like latencies and you know controls and like compression things like that it just didn't really exist so um, do we have any more questions yes um, nice <laughs> um, moving to kubernetes did you measure and did you observe any latency impact on your applications um, we did measure we didn't see a lot the 
I think we'll be able to have firmer numbers when we have, uh, com you know, the, the cluster that we have right now in Europe, we just announced the Europe release for Datadog. So these are pretty small clusters compared to what we have in the US. Uh, that being said, the latency baseline are pretty much the same. Nice. Uh, that's that's a due to the guys I mentioned before, because uh, they have been doing an amazing work. Any any more questions? <laughs> this is this is kind of why I mentioned Jamie, right? I could I could defer to him. Um, well, if, if if it's uh, if it's the end, I'm I'm honored to say that Gwen Shapiro is going to have uh, it's going to be our next speaker, and yeah. You put me in a pretty bad spot because like thirty percent of the presentation overlaps with about fifty percent of yours, so you will have to bear with some. He explained how he runs stuff in Kubernetes, and it just happened to be the same way that I run stuff in Kubernetes. So what can one do? I guess it tells you that this is the right way to do things. That sounds like I lost my connection. So 487, 445, share, connecting, and I'll share my entire desktop because I want to do a demo. And let's disconnect it and move over there. Yes, let's do clicker. You know, yeah, we don't need the connectivity, but the clicker would be nice. Sorry, guys. One second. Let's see if it works. Works. Fantastic. So, this is very similar topic to what you've just seen. Note that I'm talking about deploying Kafka Streams, which is Kafka's stream processing framework, and not the Kafka brokers themselves, which is which is the storage and messaging part of Kafka. So it's a slightly, a slight twist on the thing. And in order to explain to you how to scale Kafka streams, I'll explain a tiny bit about Kafka streams first. And then I'll explain about how Kafka streams itself scales in general. And then I'll explain, I'll quickly skip Kubernetes 101 since you've just uh, walked through it, but I will stop at a few points that are unique to Kafka streams and you don't need to do it in the brokers. In fact, they may be detrimental on the brokers. So keep in mind that those are two different talks and my recommendations do not apply to his recommendations. And then I'll make recommendations for Kafka streams, which again, specific to Kafka streams. And then if we have time and inclination and you want to see me fumble, I can do a live demo and start a nice Kafka streams application and scale it up and down a bit, just so you'll see how easy it is to do on Kubernetes, which is basically the main point. Kafka Streams is a stream processing platform, scales really, really nicely in Kubernetes without breaking sweat, basically. So Kafka Streams 101, Kafka, the part that uh, Balthazar just talked about is this part in the middle. You want to get data in and out. We have clients, we have connectors, and you, we have stream processing application, stream processing applications in general, read data from Kafka, do stuff to it, and write the data back to Kafka. Uh, if you're wondering, is it similar to what Spark Streaming is doing? Is it similar to Flink? The answer is yes, only we do it better. <laughs> okay, so let's walk through a small example of what a Kafka Streams application may look like. Again, if you worked with something like Flink, this may be slightly familiar. We start by creating an object called a stream builder and we use it to build our stream. And how do we build a stream? Well, we take a topic and topics have key and value. That's how life is in Kafka land. Uh, in this case, I'm building a, something that does stock trade statistics, just as an example. The string will be my ticker. So I have Apple and then I have some information about the current price, buy, sell, bids, etc. And I use that to build a stream of events. And then I take this stream and I say that I want to do a moving average. And moving average on each stock ticker specifically. So here is moving average on Apple price versus moving average on 3Com price. Okay, so basically I do a group by. So we'll do it on each uh, ticker specifically. And then we do a time window, take five second moving average, advance the window every second should be fairly readable. And then I aggregate. 
And my, I have a custom aggregation function, but you shouldn't worry about my custom aggregation function. In order to do an average, I add and I uh, count, basically. So I can divide by sum. And then the result, because of the way that aggregation works, is actually a table. And there is an entire topic about how in Kafka, you can move between a stream of events and a table that represents the state of every key right now. And in this case, I represent the state of the, the keys now, the keys, it's a window, the key. So we have the apple and we have the time frame, and we have a specific result. And then we have a big table of those. We move back to a stream, which basically we stream all those changes to this big table. We use, again, remember that I took sum and count, I turn it into an average, and I publish it to an output. And if I actually get to do my demo, you'll actually see how we have inputs and outputs and what they look like. Simple JSON would be what you should imagine here. And so far, this is lazy evaluation. So, so far I just described what it should do. Nothing happened, which is what makes every stream processing application in the world so frustrating to debug because the thing that you walk through when you're debugging is not really the thing that the code that you wrote, it's the code that executes. So in the next line, I'm saying, okay, create a Kafka Streams object and start running it. And that's when things actually start happening. And what does it start running? It starts running a topology. And the topology is what I built right here. So let's take a look at what a Streams topology looks like. Basically, a topology is a sequence of nodes. So we have the source node, which is our source, uh, something that reads from Kafka, a consumer, a bunch of steps, we aggregate, we window, etc. And then we have another step for mapping and an output uh, node, which basically sends the, produces events back to Kafka. And pretty much every stream job in the world looks in general sense like that. In between, we read and write from Kafka. That's like our big, somewhat controversial decision. Flink and Spark does not do that. Um, if you know, uh, uh, Facebook has a big paper about how they do stream processing. They do use this uh, method. It has drawbacks. We don't win many speed contests. On the other hand, it has many benefits in which you can actually use, reuse the in-between state for in many ways. So that's how we do things. And then if we do an aggregate, this is a stateful operation, and therefore we need to maintain states. How many events did we count so far? What was the sum of the price, etc. So we need a state store. And that's kind of the crux of the matter. So how do we scale those topologies? So first of all, as you all know, because every single one in the room knows Kafka, the input topic is going to have some partitions, hopefully a lot. And we basically create a, sh a shard of the topology for every partition. And we are because we have four partitions, we're going to have four of those shards. And you're going to have four of those, no matter how many machines you run with your application, no many, how many instances, even if you run on one node with one thread, it will still have four tasks, it will just have to circle between them really, really fast. So this is kind of the basic unit of our stream processing, you can see, You'll have, you can have up to four machines, up to four threads, you can distribute it however you want. And at the end, the topic, uh, you write results to a topic. And each one of those charts will have its own state store. So input topic, output topic, task, and a state store is the unit that goes together. And as we scale, we start with all of them on a same machine, but say that this machine is kind of overloaded, we need a new machine, they all have the state store here, we really need to move some tasks over there. We move the tasks and we need to rebuild the state store. And we'll talk about how to rebuild the state store in a second. And if we have more, we need to move stuff around a bit more. So basically this is how we scale out. In order to decide what moves and so on, this all happens automatically using the famous Kafka consumer rebalancing protocol. I'm assuming since you all know Kafka, you know about how you can add and remove consumers from a consumer group and they will rebalance. Exactly the same thing. And since we talked about scaling, let's talk about fault tolerance. We do fault tolerance the exact same way we scale. It's just the reverse process. 
which means that we just scaled out. Oh no, a node just failed. What do we do now? Well, clearly we have to rebalance and we have to move those uh, top uh, charts to other machines. So for Kafka streams, we developed a sticky assignment protocol, which means that this shard knows that it already has state over here. The consumer group as a group is aware of that. And therefore it will prefer to move this task back to where it already has some state because it will make recovery faster. For the yellow one, sorry, uh, we don't have state for you. You'll have to recreate and this takes a tiny bit longer. So fault tolerance in Kafka streams again, all this works out of the box, etc. Now we kind of described how this whole uh, topology works. How do we actually maintain the state? Like what happens in, when we do it? So obviously as you process data, every time we have an event, we have to update the state over and over and over again. All those updates are written to a change topic, which basically captures all the changes to the state. And this is a compacted topic, which means that we try to keep it relatively small. We only care about the latest change to every state. And every one of our tasks have a state, which means that every one of our tasks has a matching change log, part a matching partition in the change log topic, which means that when you try to recover the task, but looking at by replaying the change log, you don't have to replay an entire topic, you replay a single partition. And so you have, remember, you have four uh, partitions in the input topic, four uh, tasks, four state stores, four partitions in the change log, four partitions in the output, it's turtles all the way down here. So but every time something happens, we record it in the change log topic. And when you have to reinstate the state, suppose we have a new instance and we want to move stuff over, we start the tasks, we start them in shadow mode. And they will basically, the instance itself will not start, will not process any data until the state is fully recovered. And then only then it switches on. And notice that the errors are now reversed because we stopped reading from the change log and started writing to the change log. And we do some uh, magic to do fencing so you cannot really write to the change log anywhere else at the same time. And all this means that it's really important to get the the size of the change log to absolute minimum because this has lots of impact on how fast stuff recover and how fast you can move stuff around. Uh, so the change log topics are log compacted. The size of the change log topic, because it's compacted, is linear with the size of the state. We must keep at least one value for every key. So if you have tons of keys, you'll have large state and you'll have long recovery time. If you have very small number of keys, it will be in the milliseconds, there is about, I think, 50,000 stock trading on the New York Stock Exchange or something along those lines, maybe 5,000. This is very, very small state, which is why my demo is incredibly fast and you basically recover before, like it was in five, less than five seconds. Another thing that can have impact and the segment size. Remember that in Kafka, every topic has segments. The last segment, the one that you're writing to, will never get compacted. This means that the smallest possible topic size we have is by default one gigabyte. You may want to squeeze it down if your state is smaller than one gigabyte to prevent this from being too much of overhead. But yeah, and we have a lot of talks and stuff online about how to keep the, minimize the state size. This would be good reason to review those. Okay, Kubernetes 101, so I can actually show you how the scaling works on Kubernetes and make some Kubernetes specific recommendations for you. So you already know that, right? You have containers, they have jars and environment and so on. Kubernetes doesn't care about those. It cares about pods. Pods have multiple containers and they have what is known as ephemeral storage and ephemeral IP by default. You usually want to run many of them you have the option of running what is known as deployment, which is basically a large set of anonymous um, uh, pods. So all of them are considered identical. They don't have any, anything unique. If you kill one, you'll get something that is identical, but also considered totally different. It will have a different pod ID, etc. And you basically say, I want to have three of them. I want to have five of them. And you have a startup policy 
how do we start them? Do we start them one at a time? Do we start all of them together? I'll get to, to that in a second, so remember that part. And also remember that when we talk about Kubernetes replicas, not the same as the Kafka partition replicas, so just more terminology to keep track of. And then I'm not sure if that was mentioned in the previous Kubernetes talk, but the part of the policy is what is known as affinity. What is allowed to run together on the same physical host and what is not allowed to run together on the same physical host. In the case of Kafka streams, we don't want it to run all of our tasks and instances and pods on the same physical node because if that physical node goes down, we'll discover that an entire fault tolerance policy is completely and utterly worthless. We just lost everything at once. So we want anti-affinity. Sometimes you do want affinity. Kafka and Zookeeper are on the same machine is something that sometimes people choose to do for reasons. Okay, we talked about services, which we're not going to use at all. And then we talked about stateful sets, which tend to have headless services and tend to have the persistent storage volumes and the persistent claims that Baltadars are already talked about. And it tends to have, because of the headless services, tend to have persistent APs as well. And those are the pods that have identity. If I start three of those, this is number one, this is number two, this is number three, and I can say start one, wait five seconds, then start two, then start three, which is a good way to manage Kafka. Terrible way to manage Kafka streams on the other hand. In order to avoid spurious rebalances, you want to start all of them together, if at all possible, and shout down all of them at the same time, if this is what you need to do. So yeah, basically, Rolling restarts are very, very good for Kafka, normally useless for Kafka streams and just create a lot of rebalances that you don't really need. So we basically have two options to deploy Kafka streams, right? Because the state is so flex flexible, we can say it's actually a stateless set. If we lost the pod, we lost the storage, we'll recreate the state somewhere else, it's absolutely fine. Or we can say, hey, recovery time is actually faster in a, um, with the stateful sets, let's take advantage of that. So what do we actually do? What do we recommend? So as I said, this is our uh, ma main architecture. And you may say that, hey, I'm seeing a state right there. Clearly this should be stateful. But of course the state can move around. We don't actually need the state in order to run Kafka streams. We can recover it. The real state one may claim is in Kafka. So, and a lot of people don't really want to run stateful, service, sta stateful sets. So as uh, Balthazar mentioned, you may get yelled at by uh, teenagers on Hacker News and that would be absolutely terrible. Um, on the other hand, even if you don't want to, there is benefits, right? I mean, stateful sets will save you time on recovery. That's a good thing. On the other hand, if you're not running on the cloud, then you may not have the shared storage that you really need to run stateful sets well. And also you're going to, maybe you want to scale out in and out a lot and you're not going to really get to take advantage of it. So what do we really recommend, right? Okay, enough with the goats. What do we really want to do? Uh, so basically the main recommendation is keep the change log shards as small as humanly possible. If you have good shared storage, use stateful sets. There is really no strong drawback to doing that. I'll show you, you can still scale in and out as much as you want, but don't, and um, why not really? And if you don't have good storage, then you're kind of stuck uh, with normal deployments. Use anti-affinity when you can, because this means that you don't have nasty mistakes when you try to test your failover. And use the parallel pod management, meaning start all of them at once, when possible to avoid crazy uh, rebalancing situations. Okay, so this is quite cool, but does it actually work? So I'm going to try to do the demo. Do we have time to try to do the demo? Nah, no, maybe I won't do the demo. I, you have time? Okay, in any case, it's all on GitHub under my username and Kafka streams uh, stock stats, so you can also run the demo yourself. Anyway, so my demo has two kinds of examples, basically YAML files, because everyone knows that Kubernetes is all about YAML. The only kind of bugs I'm seeing are YAML bugs. Uh, so we have, um, this is a deployment, not a stateful set. 
and we give it a name. This is my stream stocks data application. We start with one replica. We can scale it out later if we need to. And we say that this is a replica of pods that match this label. And then we create a template of a pod that matches this label. We're going to run one of those. And when I spec it out, I spec the anti-affinity rules. You'll see in the real GitHub, this is actually quite long. Specking out the anti-affinity rule is quite involved. You have to say, these are the things that cannot run with those things, but are allowed to run on those hosts, etc. And then I specify my container, and this is pretty much it. That was not a lot of work at all, just in case some of you don't do it because they think it's a lot of work. No, it isn't. And now maybe I want to run um, it as a stateful set. Now the service I kind of have to declare, but I don't actually plan on using, so I don't give it any IP because there is no HTTP connections that go into my streams application. It just talks to Kafka. I declare it as a stateful set. This time, let's say two replicas and the pod management process policy of parallel. Start both of them together. And I, important, in addition to specify my container, now I specify a volume mount. And this is basically the normal mount where Kafka streams keep its state store. So here we are. And then I say, this is my volume claim. And I wanted one gigabyte, which is a total overkill for my use case, but whatever. And I read write once access policy basically means that no one else can write to it while I'm writing to it. That's the anti-corruption rule that Balta does are already mentioned. So we can see that we have those two options. And oh, I'm going to show you a demo. And if it works, you'll see that I'm only running uh, Kafka streams. I'm not talking about Kafka. I'm not running Kafka. I'm not mentioning anything about Kafka. This is because I'm using Confluent Cloud, which is a nice managed service. You may use your own Kafka on Kubernetes, which is not a managed service. So Confluent has an operator. My friend Victor here, the big Russian guy in the middle, he, um, he's the expert on Confluent operator. Hopefully he'll show up here next month to talk about it. But it makes running Kafka on Kubernetes a lot easier. Want to hear more, talk to that guy. Meanwhile, I'll zoom in a lot. Command plus. Okay, let's do it that way. Good enough? Can people see me in the back? Good? If someone cannot read it, you can move up front. But then again, you probably cannot listen to me either. So we're all good. Oh, this doesn't work completely. We can ju I can just, just put this one here. I, I have to hold it closer. Okay, can you guys hear me? Are you sure it works? Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, so, oh, and then one last thing. Okay, so, First thing that I want to do in order to demo is just to start producing some uh, events. So I'm starting a producer and this will basically generate fake stock market statistics because I, I don't work for Bloomberg and I don't have a real time stock market feed. You can see my producer starting over here. That looks good. Let's make sure that we have data. So I'm using Confluent Control Center here. And it lets me basically look at data in the topic and you can see that I'm getting new messages. This is what a stock ticker looks like. The ticker is AET. I have no clue who are AET. And this is the current price. And this is how many stocks we're buying or selling. So basically this is the, thing, the events we'll work with. Now let's start our Kubernetes cluster. I'm basically just starting my stateful set. And you can see this is fairly easy. I run the XML, I'm calling it. Come on, work. Okay, let's make sure it's actually running. Still pending. Come on, start. Okay. <laughs> it always seems to take a lot longer when you do a demo. 
I'm still not 100% sure on why. I'm, I swear it should take like 30 seconds or something, but... Uh, it's because of Zoom. No, I think it's because of uh, Murphy's Law. That's my guess. Okay, we have it running. So theoretically, we should see output. Now is the part where if you want to cross fingers for me, would be an incredibly good time. Yay! So you can see the, pri the sum of the prices, minimum price, average price, all my stock trading statistics are right here. Now you can't really troubleshoot a lot in that view. So what I normally work with, we have the consumer lag view, and we can basically see that right now we have hopefully two consumers because we started two replicas, right? Uh, so we have two, these two are the same consumers. They have the same ID and here is another one. And each one of them is reading a different partition. And we can kind of see how far behind they are. The, mo the bigger this, uh, green area is the farther behind and you'll see it kind of falls behind and then catches up and so on. So the trick is that as I add and remove nodes, I want it to basically stay updated, like not fall, not just suddenly stop and start falling behind. So let's just take a look. One thing that you usually want to take a look at is your volume. So you can see that it's a stateful set. I have two volumes. Each one of them is bounded to one of my uh, replicas. And I can say, hey, two is not enough. Maybe I'm falling behind. I want to do faster. Let's scale it out to three replicas. And even though it's a stateful set and each one of them has its own specific storage device, I can still scale it out. But in this case, I'm going to have to recreate the state from Kafka the way I showed you that earlier. Let's see if we're catching up after we did it. So first thing, hmm, I still have, did I run it? Yeah, it said scaled. Let's check if we really have three replicas. We really have three replicas. Why am I still seeing two consumers here? Okay, it didn't refresh. Now you see three consumers here. And you can also see that they pretty much immediately caught up and kept processing. There was basically, I could add additional replicas. It grew automatically. So I didn't need to stop my app. I didn't need to do anything. This is something that's quite unique to Kafka Streams, so I'm very, very proud of it. Now, what else can we do? Maybe we can scale back in, right? Oh, we can delete a pod. What will happen if I delete a pod? What happens when the delete a pod is that this specific pod with this specific identity will come back up with the same storage device that it had before, which means that it will recover quite fast. This is unlike stateless deployments, where it will just come back a completely new pod with a new pod name and no storage device. That's the basic difference. So I talked maybe too long and you cannot really tell the difference that anything even died. And that's kind of embarrassing. Uh, so you will have to trust me on that one. <laughs> yeah, but I, yeah, but then I'll have to run the same thing again. And Anyway, so that's pretty much what I wanted to show you. I can now basically, oh, I didn't even delete it. So maybe we still have a chance. Yes, so you can see the pod terminating. Let's go and see what happens. This screen refreshes every five seconds, but you can see that basically it will basically restart and keep on going. So you can see it's already restarting. It will start, start back up in a few, few seconds. And you can see that everything, you can see that now for a few milliseconds, I'm going to have only two consumers in my group and they keep chugging along. And, when the, and now I have three and they caught back up. So this is basically how it works. It's, you can kill pods, it will rebalance, something comes back up, it will rebalance again. It should be 100% totally transparent to everyone. So now I'm really done. So I'm just go getting rid of my cluster. That's kind of the boring part. That's it. Do you have questions? Does this thing really work? Mm -hmm. You just take it off. And, and you can see that once I killed it, the entire uh, lag thing went away. The lag is growing. I keep producing stuff and I'm no longer processing it. 
but because the consumer group is gone, it's all gone. Okay, now maybe time for questions. Where is the big book? Nothing? I wanted to throw the box so much. <laughs> okay, you throw. No, that's far away. No, no, you, you. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> thank you. So, um, thank you for the talk. Uh, my question is, uh, how would you do, what is your recommendation for auto-scaling Kafka Streams applications? Uh, is specifically on Kubernetes, especially that you mentioned the parallelism deployment strategy. Um, how does that apply with the auto, like if we wanted to auto scale and- Yeah, that's things. interesting. So I didn't try it, but if I had to do it, I would say that you can monitor your consumer lag. And if you see the consumer lag is growing and you still have partitions in Kafka that you know you could, if you have five partitions, you can scale up to five different uh, um, pods. So I would say that you can totally have something that automatically monitors your lag and tries to add more. Uh, again, it works well if you have small states because then as you, because the new ones will have to start recreating the state before they're useful. And while the group is rebalancing, which is not while they're recovering. While they're recovering, everything is fine. The existing ones will keep processing as usual. But at the point that they are rebalancing, and say, hey, I'm coming back online and everything, all the activity shifts, there is a small period of inactivity in the Kafka stream. And if you're really overwhelmed, uh, then it could actually be detrimental. But if you're kind of sensitive for that and the state is relatively small, then yeah, I think that would be pretty cool to try. If you're going to try it, let me know. We're going to, uh, we're, we have to try it together. Great. Thank you. <laughs> See, how, that's how you do it. <laughs> um, earlier when you were showing how you were doing the fault tolerance, you were having a database to store the state and then you were writing to a change log. I understand why you did that, but my question is, why do you have both the change log and storing the state in a database if you can just do it in the change log? Um, it's a, databases are pretty fast. Like I like uh, databases. They have indexes, you have operations like get for a specific key. They have operations like do get me all the keys in this range. You can do quite a lot of really good things with a database, which is why we really advocate the pairing of Kafka as a change log with a materialized view that contains the state of the world as it is right now in a way that's very easy to access and analyze. That makes sense? I mean- uh, Follow up question. So yes. if you need to maintain the, if you need to remember to say it for a short term, do you still recommend storing a database and change log or can you just streamline it just for the change log? Um, I mean, if you have a, what I'm hearing is that you have a very, very small change log and you can just read it from memory and it takes you almost no time, every time from scratch, so why bother with the database? Um, yes, definitely, why not? It's basically an in-memory database, right? Uh, RocksDB, which we use in Kafka Streams, is a database by Facebook, embedded database by Facebook. Very, it has very fast in-memory operations. It acts like a cache and it has on disk persistence. So we kind of didn't see any reason why not to have both, but it, the storage mechanism in Kafka Stream is pluggable. And we do have memory only stores that we use for our testing. So as you say, yes, 100% totally feasible. Okay, thank you. Whoa. <laughs> Uh, you said that um, doing like a rolling deployment wasn't particularly compatible with uh, Kafka streams because of the constant rebalancing. Yes. I was wondering if you had any recommendations for how to do things like a graduated rollout where, you know, you only want to ship uh, updated code to like a portion of your cluster or a portion of your streams consumers. It's a huge problem right now. It depends a lot on, you basically say rolling upgrade of the code of uh, Kafka streams. And it's a problem because if, if you actually change the topology, you cannot really have part of it run one task type and the others run a different task type. You will really have to stop everything. You'll actually need to delete the state because if you change the topology, usually the state is useless. So there is like the big upgrade, which you'll basically have to do probably as a blue-green deployment, really, like this, the, the old Kafka stream and the new Kafka stream and shift things in between them. And then there's small changes. 
Like, it's mostly okay, the state is okay, but I miss the ways that I'm mapping my, um, instead of uh, dividing in order to compute average, I multiplied. Like, I had a typo, and I rolled it out. This is something that you could do as a slow rollout, but this will, um, it will require rebalances. Um, I'm trying to think if that's a good thing. If you want to avoid rebalances, you can basically up the rebalance timeout by a lot. And then you can stop something, deploy new code, nothing will rebalance. You can also hack the partitioner a bit and make it more sticky than it was before. I know that there was an effort by IBM to create an even more sticky partitioner. So that could be another thing to experiment with. <laughs> and you're like, yes, I'm doing this tomorrow. <laughs> Yeah, so the quick addition to this one. So there is a thing called a rebalance uh, listener. So you can subscribe to when uh, different state changes of your application. So if you're doing something and rebalancing happening, you can subscribe for this particular event. So you can, for example, if you do something, you just need to you know, close some of the operation to get the number of partition that you're working on this point. Um, and this actually makes sense if you're trying to do this kind of like a very tricky, uh, deployment, but yeah, I agree when it's more like you're doing blue green, um, maybe even you know, changing consumer group ID, application ID, or dependent version. So, in this case, each application version will not step on each other's toes. So, but uh, in this case, you need to be very um, with offsets, you know, so, so you will not do like a duplicate uh, processing or not missing any messages to process. So, yeah. Okay, have a good night, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>